cannot touch us and uh, I have a senior moment now and then, guys, so forgive me for that. My name is Jim. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Jim. Everybody, I'm a member of the Stairway Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, we meet every Saturday at the 101 Club at 1.30 in the afternoon for a sponsorship workshop, at 7.30 for a big book study, and at 9.15 we study the language of the heart together. So we have that group has three meetings on Saturday. My sobriety date is December 20th, 1964. I've been sober through the grace of God since that time. I'm a very grateful person, as you can well understand. Last week, I had an opportunity to share with you a little bit about what happened to me. And uh, uh, I have a, a number of uh, sponsees who over the years have assured me that my drinking story is uh, very boring. And they're probably right. It wasn't particularly boring to me, but I don't have a whole lot of drama and trauma. I did spend the last four, the last uh, two months of, of drinking in, in uh, a situation which was very bad, but very life-threatening. And at the end of, the, of that time, I knew I was going to die. I knew I could not continue to live if I didn't stop drinking. And I could not stop drinking. And it came through to me loud and clear that if I had one more seizure, it would probably be my last. So I asked God for help, and God helped me right away. I, the obsession to drink was removed at that time and has never come back. Next day I found myself in AA, and last week I told you a little bit about what happened there. It was, uh, I was the most blessed of, of, of people, the most blessed of men. And the luckiest and most fortunate because just depth on blind and stupid, I walked into a meeting and I walked out with probably the two of the greatest sponsors who ever lived. They chose me. I didn't have sense enough to choose them. A doctor, or, or Father Joe had helped write the big book, so he was pretty well up on what was going on. And, and Admiral Bud Scholes had been sponsored by Bill. so. Those two guys really knew what they were doing, and was, I was so fortunate, so blessed to have them. And what happened, of course, was that they taught me right from the beginning uh, the steps, the big book, and recovery as it came and as it's revealed in the big book. And over and over again, over the years, I have been accused of being a big book thumper, and I say thank you very much for that, because that's exactly what I am. I try not to hit you over the head with it. But other than that, yes, I've been accused of being a bleeding deacon. I say thank you for that, too, because I think I know what you mean. I, I bleed AA. During the time that I was sober, one of the there were a number of things that happened in my sobriety. Two of these things stuck out in my, in my mind and still do today and, and continuously give me impetus to continue to carry the message. Both of my younger brothers, they're very dear to me, and both of them died of alcoholism after I'd been sober for quite a while. And in both cases, I, for both of them, I, I called it every big gun I could think of. And it, at that time out in California, all the big guns were out there, and they all tried to help. But Pat and Jerry wanted nothing to do with us, and they both died of this disease. And that killed my mother, and then that killed my father. So I saw this disease in its worst, absolute worst aspect. I don't ever, ever, ever take alcoholism, anything, but deadly serious. And when I talk to you and when I share with you what I, what's happened with me and what I believe, I believe it from the bottom of my heart. And in the last 37 and a half years, I've taken over 2,000 people through the steps. And I have watched this program work for those people. Some of them are here tonight, and they can tell you that this, these steps work, and this big book works, and there isn't any reason why anybody in this room ever ever has to drink or drug again. Not one single solitary reason. <coughs> Everything we need for recovery is right here. It's been given to us. We're graced with it. 
couldn't cost us a dime. All we have to do is pick up the book, find somebody who knows what they're doing, and work the steps. That's all. I uh, shared with you last week a little bit about how uh, Father Joe and, and, and Bud had taken me through the first three steps. And um, tonight, I have an option. I could go through, show you how they had me work the rest of the steps. But I kind of made the comment last week, and everybody took me up on it, that I, I've never really had an opportunity to share in, 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 in uh, sharing my story what's happened to me in sobriety. It has been an odyssey. It's been an incredible journey. Things have happened for me and to me and with me in the uh, around that, that absolutely I could never have imagined in my wildest dreams. <coughs> As most of you remember, I was a lawyer. I practiced law in Beverly Hills, and I was practicing law when I got sober. And I continue to do so for the next 10 years, 11 years. During that time, however, I was in sobriety, and I was learning, and I was growing, and my kids, I was a single father, and my children were in, they were AA brats, and they were coming into meetings with me three, four times a week, and then into Alateen. And, and they, got, they got into the steps themselves, got real snotty about it, <coughs> you can imagine. But nevertheless, all three of them learned their AA lessons, learned their 12-step lessons, and still know them today. But both of my daughters are, are heavyweights in Al-Anon. One of them is about a ninth degree black belt, I think. <laughs> I pity both of their husbands greatly. <laughs> They've learned all the lessons of the little sisters of vengeance. <laughs> and, my, and my son went his own way, but he's done very well. He started out pounding metal in a, in a, uh, in a body shop, and he ended up owning the shop, and now he owns nine of them. And I don't know how much money that kid has. He's not a kid anymore, but one of these days I may decide to borrow some from him. <laughs> he raises these funny little dogs that can't watch Shih Tzus or something like that. What are they? Is that right? Anyway. And he's got his own deal going. But I'm proud of those kids, and I, and I give AA and the 12 steps and, and a, gr a great deal of credit because I was trying to practice law, and I was trying to raise those kids, and I was trying to do my AA thing, and my sponsors did not believe in sitting around uh, waiting for osmosis to settle in. I, they put me to work and kept me there. Thank God they did. But it all worked out. You know what happened was we, the four of us, learned how to deal with life together. My daughters learned how to cook and take care of the house. And they, they, they got their responsibilities and they did them. They might have grumbled some of the time, but it got done. I love that way of life and I love what AA does, not only for us, but you know, these 12 steps are for everybody. Because the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous are not something which was made up by Bill Wilson or a bunch of guys sitting around figuring out what they were going to do how they were going to go out and impress the rest of the world. These 12 steps are spiritual principles which have been around forever. But there's a major difference. You can find all of these principles if you go to religious writings, if you go to the Bible or the Koran or the Talmud or some of the Eastern writings, you'll find the same principles. But the big difference is that for us, the 12 steps, are the same spiritual principles, but they are restated as steps of action. Just think about that. We don't have to wonder how to incorporate these spiritual principles into our lives. All we have to do is do the work. Follow directions. What's the 12 steps say? Practice these principles in all my affairs. It's a way of life. Big Book says that the spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. Now, an awful lot of things happened for me, and I, when I came in, everything I knew that when I got here was wrong. I had to start all over again. I'd learned how to live all over again. I'd learned right from wrong. I had to learn how to be self-aware, and I never knew how to do that. 
I had to learn how to deal with people, how to get along with people. I had to learn how to give love without demanding anything in return. I had to learn how to be tolerant and understanding. I had to learn how to be disciplined and consistent to lay out a, a, a day's effort and then follow through on it. I had to learn how to keep my word. I had to learn how to be honest, not just with you, but especially with myself. <coughs> And I had to learn that it was in fact possible to turn my life and my will over to the care of a loving God and day by day by day keep it there. I learned that I am, and I suspect all of you are very willful, self-centered people. I know I am. I know that my nature is to be self-centered. I know that when information comes to me, I want to sort it out to see if this is good or bad, whether I can ignore it or just let it be. But it goes no further. I know that I have the tools in the big book and in the steps to stay in a state of surrender, to stay out of self. I can go through the day each day, and I do, with things like this, sometimes out loud. God, what do you want me to do next? God, what is my next step to be? Thy will not mine be done. And I never forget when we say the Lord's Prayer together and we say, Thy will be done. We're not giving God permission. We're stating the fact that His will is going to be done whether we like it or not. I found out that in meditation was the time of surrender for me, and I think it is for all of us when we learn good meditation. And most important, I found out that the way I stay out of self is to be willing to be helpful to you without expecting a thing in the world back. And every time I'm willing to turn my thoughts to somebody I can help, I get out of my own head. And I found out this too, that when I'm buried in my head, that's a perfect definition of insanity. All those thoughts are racing around in there and collision with each other, and there aren't any kind, there's no kind of resolution whatsoever until I write it down and get it sorted out. And when I get it down on paper and I talk to somebody about it, then I can see what needs to be done. I invented this little ditty. The more you write, the better you feel. The more you write, the better you feel. Nobody taught me that. I, I, apologize, I apologize for that if it, you know, if it offends anyone. It's literally so, isn't it, Jimmy? The more you write, the better you feel. So many people know that now. Because, you see, this is, this is the antithesis of being buried in self, isn't it? The moment we get this stuff out of our heads and down on paper, something happens there. We've, we've exhausted it from our heads and we can look at what's there and then we can do something about it. And if we don't do that, we just keep on going crazier and crazier. I found out that it was deadly to allow alcoholism to continue to be untreated and that every day I had to be aware that this was the primary responsibility was to stay in, in God's pocket so that I would never again have to suffer from untreated alcoholism as I see so many around the rooms all the time these days. Hanging on by fingernails, braving it out, big smile on the face, everything is wonderful. Just don't drink and go to meetings and if you don't drink everything will change. Balderdash. <laughs> This isn't about not drinking, never has been. It's about finding God and surrendering to God and doing God's will. That's the whole program. And it doesn't have a thing in the world to do with don't drink. Because don't drink just happens to be one of the things that happens when we find God and get in his pocket. We don't even have an obsession compulsion at all to drink. It's gone, taken away. So I learned all of this stuff. Found out about myself. I work in the four step. And when I work the four step, guess what? I found out what over all of those years had not worked, I found out what had caused my failures in life. The failures, especially my relationship failures. I'm not talking about sex relations necessarily. I'm talking about relationships with all people. 
I found out what had caused my failures in all aspects of my life. Even though I considered myself to be a pretty successful guy at that point, still, once I did my fourth step, I found out what didn't work. And then what my sponsor said, okay, now you know what didn't work. Now you're going to start doing what will work. And if you do what will work, your whole life will change. So that's the whole thing. That's what we're doing here. Find out what didn't work and start doing what will work. I found out when I did my four steps that I was blocked from God, and I didn't think I was. I thought I had a pretty good connection with the old boy. The truth of the matter is I was blocked by, by defects of character and by insanity and by guilt and remorse and shame, and I had to be free of those things. And doing my four step, I found out what they were. And then these guys got me, they double teamed me in the fifth step. And that was an adventure, believe me because it was like good guy, bad guy, you know, good cop, bad cop. Man, they whipsawed me back. They wouldn't let me get this away with anything. This thing went on for about 12 hours, and I have to tell you, I was wrung out when we got through. I asked him, aren't you guys tired? He said, no, we've been having fun. <laughs> <laughs> but what the big book told me was going to happen did happen. My fears were gone. I had developed a high degree of humility and honesty and, 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 my, and I had courage now. My fears had been taken from me. I, I felt like I was having a spiritual awakening, a spiritual experience. I felt close to God. And for one thing, I felt real sure by that time that the drink problem had disappeared. This was in the fifth step. And I realize now, since all this time has passed, that that's, that's not all unusual. It happens quite often. We get, we get tremendous results from properly done fifth step. I got through with my fifth step, sixth step was easy. I'd already decided to get rid of all that stuff that was killing me that I couldn't get rid of myself and I needed God's help with. So I did that and I took the seven step prayer and I asked him to take this stuff away. I already done my eight step list when I did my four step. I had to add a couple of names and I had to write down what I was going to do to make amends and to pass it by my sponsors and they didn't agree on half the stuff and they showed me what I was supposed to do. Made sure I understood that I had said I would go to any lengths for victory over alcohol and to make a complete surrender. And then they showed me what it says in the big book because I was still new. You know, you got to remember that this was all happening. I was about 35, 38 days sober at this point. And in the big book on page 77, it's speaking directly to us, you know, to we who are new. At the moment, it says we're trying to put our lives in order. But this is not an end in itself. It says our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people of others. Now, when I read that, and I asked Father Joe about it. He said, now look here. He said, most people are born and life's a bitch and they die. And so what? Where was the purpose in their life? It was the purpose of life to steal as much pleasure and fun and, and happiness as possible, to get as much ease and comfort as possible, to, uh, uh, to arrange as much sex as possible. No. We need to have a purpose in life. He said, we do. We in AA have a purpose. To fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us and then to go and do it and to stay fit and to stay able and ready and willing to carry this message to others. To be the messenger for God, to be the example of his power working in our lives so that we can be helpful to others. This is our mission. This is our, it's a holy mission, Bill Wilson called it. Then I learned, too, that there was something which had to happen in order for me to stay sober and to continue to grow spiritually. I had to get disciplined. It was essential to be, a, be willing to, to, to set a, a, a standard of my conduct and to follow through on it, an agenda. And I asked my sponsors, what is it that is, what is this one day at a the time? They said it means that today you went to a meeting. And 
he said, and today you prayed, and today you meditated, and today you took the inventory, and today you worked for another alcoholic. He said, if you do that each day from now on, you'll never drink again, and you'll continue to grow spiritually, and you'll stay in God's pocket if you do that. And so I took that seriously, and for the most part, I've been able to do that. They showed me the 10th and 11th steps as being those steps where I would grow spiritually and I would continue to take inventory and I would continue to seek to improve my conscious contact with God. They taught me to pray and to meditate. They taught me to meditate in this sense, in this sense only. That if I were to go to you, for example, and if I were to say to you, please sit down, I have a very important question to ask you. And I really need an answer to this. And I need your help. And then I ask you the question. And while you're thinking of the answer and getting ready to help me, I turn my back and walk away. You say, well, you got to be nuts. Well, isn't that what we do when we pray and ask God and then we don't wait and listen for the answer? That's what we do when we meditate. We listen for the answer. And this is what I was taught. And then we spent a lot of time on that 12 step, and they taught me an awful lot about being a sponsor. By the way, I have, a, a, I have to admit this, I got a little bit of a problem with this term, temporary sponsor. I think that's an oxymoron, but I'm not sure. I can't quite figure out what a temporary sponsor is supposed to be. I suppose you're either a sponsor or you're not. But the whole idea of temporary kind of rubs me the wrong way. I can't imagine what that might be. Anyway, that's just me. So my sponsors got me started by my 47th day of sobriety. I was working my 11th step, keeping my journal. And I was off and running. And I, and I had my, my first babies, we called them babies back then, when I was about three or four months sober. And from then on, it's been just constant. And it's been a life beyond anything anyone could ever. I, I'll tell you something. If, if I had $10 billion, I could not buy what I have received simply by continuing to do the work as it's laid out, following the directions in the big book, and making every effort to be faithful to God's will and to carry his message and to be in a state of surrender as much as possible. And, and this is just it. And I don't know why, there, there's something that goes, there's a dynamic involved here, guys. When we're doing what we're supposed to do, things work. I was taught that I had to get myself completely out of the way of results. Now, if you, you know, we have, a, we have several examples of that in the big book, but perhaps the most important one we find on, on page 68, where we're, the big book is talking about the remedy for fears. And it tells us this, that so long as we do what we believe God would have us and humbly rely upon Him, does He enable us to match calamity with serenity? In other words, it's very simple. Do what's in front of me to be done. Do what I believe would have God would have me do. But for goodness sakes, let God have the result. Don't try to force anything to happen anymore. Don't try to force it to be my will, but let it be his will. And every time I can remember to do that, amazing things happen. I was talking to a friend of mine today, and he said, you know, there's one thing I've noticed about you. When you say that you're going you're to trust God and let him have the result, you really mean it, don't you? And I said, sure. Because I've learned that that's the only thing that works. The only thing that works. Every time I try to force my life, I get myself another jackpot. I say, why in the world did I do it? Just like the guy who went down, was out, found himself at the bar drinking. He said, what, how the hell did I get here? What am I doing? This is crazy. Get out of the way, Jim. Let God have the result. And when I do that, it works. <laughs> well, all of this prepared me or a new life, and I've had it. I've had a new life. I've had things in my life. Let me give you a few examples of what's happened. While I was, I'd only been, I'd only been sober a short time. I was practicing law in Beverly Hills. 
And a man named Carroll Shelby came into my office. Carroll Shelby, some of you may have heard of. He's a great race driver, and he's, he's, the, uh, he's the guy who developed the uh, Shelby Cobra and the GT40 and some very <laughs> fine race cars and, and he's associated with Ford and has been for a long time. Carroll Shelby was at that time uh, retired from racing, but he was he was building a new sports car called the, the Shelby Cobra using a Ford engine and an AC Bristol body. And he came and he said, I'm, I'm going to open up a, a new factory out in Santa Monica. I'm getting out of Pico Rivera and people want my cars. And, Will you give me a hand here? And I said, sure. So I became his general counsel. And this went on and it, it, was, it was building very rapidly. Shelby came to me one day and he said, uh, I think we've got to deal with Goodyear. I want you to go back to Akron and talk to the people at Goodyear and see what you can put together. So I flew back to Cleveland and the people from Goodyear sent a car up and brought me down to Akron. And we sat there and cut a deal and I was the president and chairman of the board and the chief counsel and the head of the head accountant for, for Goodyear and they said, we've got a president's discretionary fund. We want to be, we want to be out of Firestone. We want to be the tires on American racetracks. And so we're going to put up at least $3 million and you guys are going to build us a race team and you're going to go racing at Indianapolis and on the USAC circuit. So I went back and told Shelby, I said, you want to really do this? He said, sure, let's do it. So we brought in Dan Gurney and a couple other people and, and you know, these are people who were all heroes of mine at the time, but here I am. Rubbing elbows with him, Dan and I went over to uh, we went over to England, and, and we we met with the Colin Chapman, who was the head of Lotus over there, and we talked to him, and we hired away the guy who designed his cars and the guy who ran his body shop. And we brought him back to Santa Ana, and we built a shop there, and we started designing the first monocoque race car in the United States, called American Eagle. And this went on, we finally ended up with a race team, and I ended up being the, the team manager every weekend going to the races. I became known as the hatchet man, because uh, I just put my old marine training to work, and you know, on the track you have to be a little bit tough. And so one, one day, John Frankenheimer came to my office, and he said, I want to do a movie which I'm going to call the Grand Prix, and I understand from Shelby that you know a little bit about cars, said, how about setting this thing up for me? So John had me go to Europe for him, and I, I went to each of the manufacturers, and I got them to release to me the, the uh, specifications on their new cars that were coming out the next year. And then I went to all of the Grand Prix tracks in Europe and South Africa and so forth, and got them set up so that we could go in and shoot. And then James Garner was brought in as the as the uh, principal star, and we went, we went to, uh, went to the whole Grand Prix circuit the next year, and, and made the movie the Grand Prix. Some of you may have seen it. And this was, uh, all of this was just, just falling in my lap. And I'd been, I'd been just doing, you know, donkey kind of stuff as far as law, law work was done, it was concerned. And all of a sudden, all of these things began to open up for me. Everywhere I went, everywhere I went, I was going to meetings. And it was incredible what I was finding. I could sit in a meeting that was being conducted in German and I could understand 90% of it. I don't know a thing about German. But, it, but you know, the, the, the big book, we translate it and you begin to hear a little bit and I know the big book pretty well so I didn't have any problem with that. And in Spanish and in French and in South Africa, they, in, in Dutch, was weird, man. I could be in these meetings and I felt right at home. And I was never, ever, ever treated with anything except the greatest courtesy wherever I went. And so I really got an understanding of the worldwide emphasis of AA. I've been in AA in 18 different foreign countries in almost every state in the United States. Now here again, this is something that I didn't plan and I couldn't have planned it. God has granted me this most wonderful kind of adventure life. I remember um, this was this was pretty interesting. At least it was to me. 
I got into the thoroughbred horse business. I sold my law practice, and, and I was uh, I came to Florida. I was a member of Little River in 1980 when they were up above the uh, McDonald's area, a little dinky room, maybe 20 people at a meeting. You should see it now. I mean, it's a total madhouse now. But that time it was a pretty reasonable place. We had these small meetings, and uh, I got into the thoroughbred horse business, and we had. We were selling thoroughbred horses right and left. That was the big boom in thoroughbreds. We ended up with two farms in Ocala and two farms in Lexington and 40 horses on the track and a whole bunch of people who were investing in, in horses. And so it was it was really, and it just, it just boomed. It went boom like that from nothing to this uh, incredible business. And uh, running around all over the country bidding at the auctions and buying horses and stuff. Now, in the meantime, I have to tell you that there were there were ladies who came along. You know, I've I've been single since I've been sober, and, and I, there's probably a connection here somewhere. But I'm not I'm not sure that anybody could, I'm not sure anybody could really put up with me for that length of time. But uh, there have been some beautiful ladies in my life. None of them, by the way, were uh, none of them were uh, members of the fellowship. I didn't plan it that way, it's just the way it worked out. But I found out something very interesting, this is kind of a little sidelight, but I found out that if two people are together and one is growing spiritually and the other is not, they're gonna grow apart. And it's inevitable. I don't know any way that you can remedy that situation. So anyway, what happened, We I, I went down to Columbia and I was gonna buy some resources down there because. I got this bright idea that they were that they were really turned down turned in some great times down there at a high altitude and I was going to come back with a bunch of Colombian racehorses and just wipe everybody out here you know all this grandiose crap so I went down there and uh, got to know the people in the survey business down at the track and and I found out that they were a bunch of little rats and all of them are a couple hundred pounds underweight none of them had they didn't have a farrier down there worth a name. And I couldn't figure out how in the world they were even getting around the track, but they were. So in the meantime, somebody took me to a, a, a horse show and I saw the Colombian Paso Finos. I fell in love with those horses. God, they're beautiful. See, the Paso Pino is a breed which has been kept immaculate for 450 years. These are the horses that came with the conquistadores, and they have never been interbred with other horses. They're it's the same strain that came over from from, from uh, Spain, and they're Arab and Barb and Andalusian. They're great, great horses, and they, they have this wonderful gait. You can sit on them and go 25 miles, and you never move. You're just like riding in your Cadillac. Incredible animals. So, uh, I got interested in these horses, and I got the bright idea, maybe I can bring some of these Paso Pinos to the United States and find a market for them here. Well, here was the problem and the opportunity. All the best Paso Pinos are owned by the cocaine mafia, <laughs> the narco traficantes. Now, gringos are not welcome down there very much anyway, much less going to, going to see these these guys, so I had, it took me a while, but I finally weaseled my way in. And I got an invitation from Don Fabio Ochoa, who was the uh, godfather of the whole mess down there in Medellin. And uh, she come down to his finca and talk to him and look at some of his horses. So I did. It was interesting because you, his, his, his farm, his finca, his ranch, was up on a hill. There's a winding road going up to it. To get through the gate, there's three or four guys down there with Mac-10s and shotguns and, and two real nasty dogs. Once they let you in, every 20 feet along this winding driveway was somebody standing there with a gun. I mean, he had about 200 people in his army. And so I finally got up, and, and then I, I'd never met this guy before, but, but here he was, a great big old fat guy. And he welcomed me, and he, and he, and he brought me in to uh, see his horses. And we got to be pretty good friends. Now his his sons are the are the they're they were they were top of the heap. 
uh, Jorge Ochoa, his oldest son, was uh, Pablo Escobar, and he were the two guys who were running the whole shebang down there. And they had big prices on their heads. And these people are incredible people because they, they're so wealthy, they have so much money, and most of it in cash, I mean, like billions, and yet they still live very simply. And, and uh, they don't think there's anything wrong with what they do. Medellin, which is the headquarters of this bunch, is the state of Antioquia. And Antioquia, has, they've been smugglers there for 400 years. This is what they do, they smuggle. And they don't care what they smuggle, as long as somebody's going to buy it, they'll smuggle it. And so they don't attach any kind of moral significance to what they do. There is, of course, the legal problem that what they're doing is highly illegal <coughs> everywhere. But that doesn't bother me doing that. All that's their heritage. And so finally, I got to a point where I could go there any time I wanted. And Don Fabio introduced me around. He introduced me to Don Daigo Chica, who was his. Dido Chico is an interesting guy too because he's the foremost rejonador in all of South America that he's a bullfighter on, on horseback. And I used to go over to his place and watch him training his Andalusians to fight with the bulls. And uh, th then they were always having these tiendas where they bring in the young uh, calves to see if, if, they were, if they were brave or not. And they'd always have famous matadors and they'd invite a few people. I got invited to those things too. And I, was, and I started buying their horses. And I got my own vet, and I had my vet checking them out, and, and it got to a point where I'd go down any time I wanted. But then one day, oh boy, it scared me to death. Because you see, the American Embassy knew what I was doing, and they kept calling me in and saying, you gotta tell us what you find. I said, no, I'm not. This embassy is as leaky as a sieve. The first time anybody thought that I was any kind of a spy, I'm dead, they'll kill me. So I didn't say anything, and they knew it. But I got a call one day and, and uh, said, don't come down to Medellin. The word is out that you're a DEA agent. I said, tilt? Whew, wow. Maybe I better get the next plane out of this country. So I called Don Fabio, and, and he said, no, he said, yeah, this was kind of a put down. He said, no, he said, I know you're not. You're too old. <laughs> <laughs> So he said, uh, let me straighten it out and then call me back and, uh, and uh, it should be a couple of weeks. I'll put the word out here, okay. Which he did and those, the next time I went down there, I gotta tell you, I was looking all around. Cause I didn't know what one of those screwy cowboys might do, just who hadn't gotten the word yet. But it worked out okay. But here's something really interesting that happened down there. Uh, th there was all kinds of stuff going on. It was really an adventure. but. One day, I'd been going to meetings all the time, especially in Bogota, and I ran into a guy named Father Jerome. He was a, he was a Jesuit priest who was a missionary father, and he, he's also one of us. So we got talking, and he said, you know, there's, there are two or three towns here in uh, Colombia that don't have AA. Would you like to help me set up AA groups? And I said, sure. Come on, Jerry, let's go do it. He says, okay, well, we're gonna, first we're going to go to Letitia. And boy, I said, well, why, why do you want to go there? He said, well, they don't have AA there. That's a good place to start. And I said, okay, well, now Letitia, this is, a, this is a, a, a crazy place. It's right down the headwaters of the Amazon, and it's a crossroads for all the cocaine the paste and stuff coming through and going up into the jungle to be processed. And it's a wild west town. A lot of people, a whole bunch of people down there walk around with guns strapped to their hips. And when, you, and, and when you're trying to sleep at night, the jaguars and the bull cro crocodiles are out there roaring. And, I mean it's, and, the, and the two hotels are really pretty crappy. But anyway, we said, well, let's see what we can do. So we, got, we, we, we hired a room in a hotel, a little banquet room. We put, a, we put an ad in the local paper, which in effect said, if you're having trouble with alcohol, come to a free seminar on Saturday at this hotel. And we figured 10, 12 people might show up. Would you believe that 300 people showed up that day? 300! 
Good Lord. And out of the 330 of them formed the first group in Letitia. They're still going. I hear from Jerry all the time. And uh, so we did that. We, we figured this will work here. It'll work anywhere. So we went to five more towns in Columbia and did exactly the same thing. And it worked just as well wherever we tried it. Now, I know um, we don't advertise or anything, you know, no promotion. But um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have traded that method for anything. We didn't have the time to be running around in the, in the bars trying to get people interested in becoming AA members. We needed to move fast. So that worked good. It was quite an adventure, and it showed me, let me tell you what, it, I, the, the lesson I got out of this was that there's so much more, you see, that we can do than what we're doing. Because we get so buried in our own affairs and our own the things that are going on with us that um, we forget that we have a responsibility to carry this message. And yet, whenever we get off our duck and go do it, the rewards are so incredible. Uh, there are people in this room right now I know who do an awful lot of work like that, and and uh, and I know uh, I know what what the results are for them. I mean, you, you want to have your heritage, which is to be happy, joyous, and free, work for it. We, we can't just sit back and, 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 and wait for this stuff to come. We have to put the effort into it. But, but, it, but, it's, but it's not a chore, you see. I mean, it's not a, a terrible thing. It's a wonderful thing because we have the opportunity and we have been empowered to do this. When we, when we have reached our 12th step, we are empowered to carry this message and we'll have the opportunity to do it. And every time we get off our duck and go do it, there are wonderful things that happen. One of the things I suppose that is so important for us to remember is that we must never say no. Here, here let me tell you why I say that. I've taken, I, I believe, that every opportunity we receive for service is God-given and God-directed. I'm not about to second-guess it. And I will say yes. And I don't fall for this stuff about you're supposed to balance your life. Anytime I hear somebody get up here and say, I'm balancing my life, I give them about six weeks before they drink again. Why? Why? It's very simple. The moment I say I'm going to balance my life, I'm taking charge of my life, that's exactly the opposite of what we must do. That's the opposite of surrender, isn't it? It means that we've decided to put ourselves first and God second. But every time that we are willing to accept as God's will, those things which happen and then go with it, gee, it works. Say, wow, this keeps right on working. If I just get the hell out of the way, let God have his way with me. What did we say in our third step prayer? to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. What do we mean by that? If we, if we don't mean it exactly as it sounds, we don't, it doesn't mean anything. It's either complete surrender or it's not. One of the things I was taught, and it's, it never left me, is that in our big book, the big book is filled with what the philosophers call categorical imperatives. That means absolutes. And modern AA, New Age AA, would have us believe that really we need to look at comparative stuff. Comparative this, comparative that. This, this might be okay for here, but we can head you over here and so on. The big book never does that. It always tells us exactly how the cow ate the cabbage. It tells us exactly and precisely what they did to recover. And they never vary from that, and they never vary from the, from the assertion that they believe and absolutely believe and wholeheartedly, and I believe they're right, that, that if we will follow exactly what they did, precisely what they did, we too will recover. And that's true. Sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to do that because being human, we, we love it when somebody comes to us with a, uh, an easier, softer way. When somebody shows us that there's, there's, a, there's another way to do these steps that doesn't follow the big book, but don't worry about it. 
one step a year, some places they're doing now. How in the world does anybody stay sober doing that? I can't imagine. One step a month, where does that come from? Another one I heard the other day, and it amazed me. It doesn't matter how you do the steps so long as you do them. Whew. Well, maybe, you know, I guess there are people who skate that way and, and it works for them. But boy, I sure wouldn't trust my life and my spirit and my soul to that. What I want to do, and I've done, and I, what I ask others to do and work with, is to figure out that the couple of million people who have already recovered utilizing these 12 steps must not have been wrong. There's something right about this. We don't have to, you know, we don't have to worry as we did, that we might have done in 1939, whether these guys knew what the hell they were talking about. We take it with a big grain of salt. How can we do that now? Look at the record. Look at what's happened. Look at uh, 140 or 150 countries now where we have the, the, the AA program. Look at the millions upon millions of members worldwide. Look at the recoveries that are going on. Look at the 50 or so other 12-step groups which are formed around the 12 steps. What's happening here? Why is it that we insist that we have to do it differently? Why is it that we insist that we know better? Why is it that we insist that it is, it is not true and cannot be true that the 12 steps were divinely inspired as they are written? Maybe because we don't want to have to do that. Maybe because we don't really want to have to look at ourselves. Maybe because it is our nature not to be honest with ourselves. Maybe because we've been running from ourselves all our lives and hiding behind booze and drugs to dull the pain. Maybe because we're afraid of sobriety. Because sobriety brings commitment. Sobriety brings change. And maybe we're afraid of that. Now, I'm not sure what it all is, but there's one question I would always ask myself. How valuable is my spirit? How valuable is my soul? Am I willing to consign my spirit to the junk heap of life? Do I think so little of the spirit within me that I'm willing to ignore what I must do in order to fill that spirit with God? Am I willing to just drift until it it's time to cash out because that's exactly what will happen. And so many people answer that question, yes I am. I don't want to do this thing. I'm afraid of it. I'm not willing to face myself. It's too painful. I'm not willing to face the things I have done. It's too painful. I'm not willing to face the people I have done those things to. It's too painful. I'm not willing to pay back what I owe. It's too painful. I never make it. What I really want is to find a way so, to be able to drink and drug successfully. And I'm going to do everything I can to try to do that. And after I've been sober or clean for a while, I'm going to tell myself, well, i got it made now. Now I can go on. Now I know I can control it. Now I know that I can have some, just go out and have some fun. How can a person have any fun if they're not able to drink and drug? What kind of a life can you have when you have to sit around and be dull and glum and boring with a bunch of old AA people who don't know what it even means to laugh? And that's such all utter nonsense. Most of the people who are in here today and have been around for a while will tell you they've never had so much happiness in their lives. Never had so much joy in their lives. Big Book says something I believe in absolutely. We absolutely insist upon enjoying life. To Abraham Lincoln said, you know, that I, I reckon a man is about as happy as he wants to be. So the odyssey of, of, uh, of uh, recovery for me has been an adventure. There are a number of other, I've been, done so many other things. I never know what's going to happen next. And I'll tell you what's happened. I've come to believe that it's absolutely so that when a door opens, I can just walk through it. 
And if it doesn't work out, I walk back down. And I don't worry about it. I meet people that way, I, I form friendships that way that are incredible. So I'm not afraid. I figured out a long time ago that every time I'm afraid I'm insulting God. What I'm really saying is, God, I don't trust you. I think some of you know that, that one of my latest adventures was five months in a federal prison. And I went to prison, I was arrested and tried and convicted and imprisoned when I was 70 years old. And 32, 33 years sober. And I'd never been arrested before in my life. I'd been in plenty of prisons as a lawyer, but never had those bars closed behind me that I couldn't get out. And, and this, was, this was a major adventure. And I'm telling you, when I first got arrested, I was scared to death. I heard all the stories. But about five minutes after I was arrested, I said, God, I'm not even going to try to handle this. This is for you. I'm going to let you have it. I'm going to keep my head down, my mouth shut, and do whatever I need to do, but I'm going to trust you. And I did, and I spent the next five months doing that. It worked out just fine. Just, just in case you might think I'm some kind of horrible felon, I'll tell you what happened very briefly. I had uh, been in business with a guy who was also a sponsee, and I had done his fourth and fifth step with him, and in the process of that, I'd learned about certain criminal activities he's engaged in. I was subpoenaed by the federal government to testify before a federal grand jury, and one, some of the things he wanted to know was what I knew about his criminal activities, and I refused to tell him. And so I was arrested and imprisoned and tried for contempt. And they stuck me away for five months, and they wanted to keep me another year and a half, but the judge finally got to it, and he said, whoa, wait a second, we're not going to do this, this is ridiculous, and he let me go. i got to tell you, though, that walking into that prison and getting to know my fellow inmates was something else again. <laughs> ah, one thing i got to tell you, if you got to go to prison, be old. <laughs> Some of you guys probably know. I walked in there and they say, hey, Pops. Well, in prison, Pops is a very special category. And they don't, they don't bug you too much. You get to be kind of like an elder statesman. The thing is, you've got to listen to everybody's story about why they're innocent. <laughs> about halfway through this adventure, a friend of mine sent me a soft cover big book. I was out there reading it in the day area. Two guys came over and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading a big book. What's a big book? Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, yeah? They got interested. Before long, I had a meeting every day. Five, six, seven guys. Got out of that big book. I said, thank you, God. Maybe that's the reason I'm here. That's a dirty trick, though, God. <laughs> Very dirty trick. Oh, boy. Linda, I don't want to run over here. Can, you know, this is the kind of stuff I just keep talking forever. <laughs> God has given me so much, and, and but that's part of it. And what I guess the message, if there is one, and I, I've just been rambling around here, but the message is, you want a damn good life, you want to be happy, joyous, and free, you want to have adventures, you want to be free of fear, you want to be able to go and do things no matter what they are, no matter... Uh, how afraid you might have been in the past. You want to be able to do these things without any fear of drinking and drug and knowing that you're completely free of that. Work the steps, stick around, trust God, and you will be able to do it too. I know because that's what's happened for me. Thank you very much.